thank you very much for joining us for this sixth episode of Experts Next Door, which is a monthly forum presented by Saratoga County History Centre, where we invite experts in a diverse set of disciplines to um, share their knowledge with us. Uh, my name is Isabel Connell. I'm your stand-in host for tonight, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees uh, for the Centre. And it's fantastic to have so many people joining us. I think this is pretty close to a record. Uh, I, th I think it is a record, actually, for the number of people who've joined us. Um, for our, our members, especially our new members who've joined this well, the last 24 hours or 48 hours. Thank you so much. None of this would be possible without you. And for our non-members, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, you're very welcome. And we hope that you'll decide to join us um, for future events. We would love to have you. Uh, some logistical things first, um, before we start. Uh, you, you came in on mute. We'd appreciate it if you stayed um, with the mute button switched on. Um, we'd love to see your faces, um, so you know, we don't mind seeing the video unless you're in the middle of dinner or something like that, but we'd really rather not hear your dogs or your phones going or that sort of stuff. Um, I think that's all. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is um, rather than um, asking questions verbally, it's much easier with these if you just put them in the chat at any time. Um, if you think of something and then Sean can take his choice and either answer them as he's flowing through or probably more likely he'll just leave them all till the end but please if any questions come up or any comments come up please just put them in the chat it's uh, um, if you move your point your mouse down to the bottom of the screen you should find the chat button in there so now for the presentation um We've all heard about the battles of Saratoga, um, the turning point of the American Revolution, but there's a lot more to it than, than that, than uh, just a couple of weeks. And uh, we are going to hear today what happens around this, this story that we think we know so much about, um, what happened in this area before and afterwards. Now, Sean Keller has been the historian for the town of Saratoga for 17 years. He's an ACE award-winning television producer and spent over a decade working for a PBS station and on national productions, including the PBS American Experience. He's also a well-respected educator, producing resources for the upstate New York American History Education Alliance, directing projects for the National Teacher Training Institute, for math, science, and technology, and also the New Hampshire Teacher Training Institute for Character and Citizenship Education. Locally, Sean has served as a commissioner for the New York State French and Indian War 250th anniversary commemoration, and was the director of the Washington County Fair Farm Museum. He has held elected offices as Schuylerville Public Library Trustee, and also commissioner in the Quaker Springs Fire District. His talk tonight is entitled, Saratoga after the battles in the American War of Independence, a borderland conflict. Sean, over to you. All right, thank you, Isabel. Um, so this is my first time doing a Zoom presentation. So hopefully this will go smoothly. I don't think I got all the technology down. So you may see updates from um, my calendar or whatever um as we go through but i think it just says notification now so don't let that throw you so um to start off with this is going to be mostly a slide presentation but i'm trying to accomplish four basic goals one is to explain what a borderland is the second is to explain what was in saratoga before the american revolution then i'm going to try to give you the briefest outline on the battles of saratoga and then we're going to get into the heart of it, which is what happened in the American Revolution after the battles of Saratoga here in this community. So I'm going to start off by switching um, screens and hopefully three. All right, it should be going. So hopefully. Um, of course, is not on the first screen. Okay. 
Yeah, and it's going backwards. So pardon me as I, oops, I'm gonna have to jump out of here for a second, go to the first screen and jump back in. Okay, so um, the talk, um, I wanna give some quick credits. Um, this talk really wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the staff at the Saratoga National Historical Park. Um, I'm lucky as a historian, I'm in a community that is constantly doing research and it's a constantly evolving our knowledge within the community of what happened. And that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the National Park Service staff. Uh, in particular, Chris Martin and Chris Verlosen um, do an awful lot of work and they sponsor or they, they help arrange for research to happen with our community. And then the, their interpreter staff, um, Eric Schnitzer is the historian, Megan Stevens has done some great work on slavery in the area. Bill Velosen has done yeoman duty on a myriad of, of subjects. And we've been fortunate to have authors working in our community. David Preston is the most recent and I also used a, a lot of work from uh, Steve Strack. Um, Steve's deceased now, but he was a great compiler of, of information. We've also received a lot of funding from the American Battlefield Protection Program in Eastern National Park, or National, um, Eastern National, which runs the bookstore. Um, so I, I wanna talk a little bit about Saratoga as a borderland area, but it's first really important to mention that um, as the local historian, I'm dedicated to bringing people together in this internationally significant community to explore the American struggle to create and sustain a free society. But I also recognize that this community stands on native grounds and we're committed to working with our native American allies to interpret the historical experience of New York's native communities and tell the story of their important and unique contributions to the region and to the nation. We also acknowledge the role that this community has played in the actions taken and the words spoken in the history of conquest which has resulted in lasting damage to native societies, in particular, the Iroquois Confederacy and the Algonquins. This story of our community really represents the intersection of four major worlds in the colonial Northeast, New France, the Iroquois Confederacy, the Algonquins, in particular, the Scattercooks and the Wabanaki, and the Northern British colonies of New York and New England. And this includes the area of the New Netherlands and the early Dutch pres presence and legacy in the upper Hudson Valley. At stake in this borderland story is nothing less than the future of North America. And as each group struggles with their respective independence, security and strategic goals. So what is a borderlands? A borderlands is kind of an ill-defined frontier. It's borderless grounds. It's a contested area at the fringe of empires. It's the space between nations or imperial strongholds. Um, some examples of well-known ones would be the Great Lakes or the lower Missouri Valley. Um, but this area fits in it and it has a long history of conflict. This gives you an outline of the various wars from the 17th century up into the 19th century that just happened within the Saratoga borderland area. And when I'm defining Saratoga borderland, it, it's really Albany and Montreal. And it's that fight between Albany and Montreal. So really our borderland from Albany is Saratoga. And from Montreal, the borderland is um, St. Jean, St. John. Um, 
up in Quebec. So both Saratoga and St. Jean and St. John become the, um, the jumping off spots. So what happened within the borderland? There was a total of six wars over 125 years. There's at least 10 military expeditions. There's a number of battles just here in Saratoga that are still to be defined. And there's a diverse community of Native Americans, enslaved Africans, Europeans of different cultural and religious background, and they all settled here. Saratoga region is really at the heart of a significant borderland in the 17th and 18th century, which just reaches into a little bit of the 19th century. The establishment of British some, um, supremacy in the region, let alone American independence, was very far from a foregone conclusion during this period. In Saratoga, Stillwater, Scattercook, were home, it was the home of a diverse population of Native Americans, as well as British, Dutch, French settlers, and African descendant slaves. So one of the basis to kind of move this story forward is that in Saratoga, during the French and Indian War, there was a supply depot that was called Fort Hardy, and it was vital for supplying um, the British troops as they went further north, and it was an encampment route along this great war path. Before, um, before the American Revolution in the Saratoga borderland, um, in the 1760s, kind of as the French and Indian War ended, economic growth in the area can, could happen. It, was, it became a safe place. And Philip Schuyler began to develop his Saratoga estate. Um, he built mills along Fish Creek and he had his own men and he had also a number of slaves. Um, and they, con they converted forest trees into boards and shingles. Mu much of Skyla's financial gain came from harvesting the white and pitch pines in this area. The lumber was cut, it was rafted down the Hudson River during periods of high water, and it was sent to either Albany or sent to New York. Now, Skyla wasn't the only person, in fact, he set other people up here. And I'm going to just kind of put a bookmark here to say one of the people just a little bit further to our north in Fort Miller was William Dewar. Um, he was from Scotland and he set up an estate very similar to Schuyler's estate. Uh, Schuyler's estate in 1763 had two sawmills, an upper and lower one. And sawmills are really kind of key to making everything happen because there you convert the wood into, into lumber, which is a commodity that can be sold or it can also be adapted so that you could create barrels to ship other things in. You could build houses and so on. Um, the lower sawmill was on the southern bank of the Fish Creek, just below the Route 4 bridge. If you, if you look, across, or if you look out on the Route 4 bridge, you can actually see the remains of that sawmill. And then the larger of the two was the upper sawmill. And that was up in Victory, um, almost across from the current um, Victory Mill. Um, it, there's a blue and gold marker uh, in Smithville, actually, um, across, across Fish Creek from Victory, um, and it was just a little bit below that. So we had a visitor, we had an awful lot of visitors here, but Mrs. Grant um, of Langdon in Scotland wrote in a memoir um, that when she visited here in 1768, there were a number of Negroes who were well acquainted with felling, felling of trees and managing the sawmills. There's an awful lot of accounts of the sawmills being run by slaves. Um, they um, took advantage of trade and lumber and they floated it down the river. Um, 
she described this new settlement as an asylum for anybody who wanted bread in a home. There was a variety of employment. Um, every artisan and laborer could be found here in every occupation. Um, in the winter, they're engaged in the sawmill. In the summer, they had a very large and productive fishery. Uh, part of what's important um, that she doesn't get into, but it's kind of a different viewpoint, but Saratoga at that point was really, it was an international frontier shipping port in the Atlantic world. So if you change our boundaries and you don't look at things as just um, North America with the United States and Canada and Europe and um, Africa and the Caribbean, but you look at, at it all interconnected as a as a Atlantic world. Skylaville, uh, back then Saratoga, was really a frontier port where Schuyler himself was involved in trading, whether it be this wood or the fish, and he would trade with the sugar producing islands of Jamaica and Antigua. Now, those islands were, were producing sugar so quickly that they didn't even bother to um, have enough food to feed their, their people, their slaves. They would end up buying things like the fish from Saratoga to feed their slaves. So, Schuyler became very, very involved in the slave trade um, through this. And it was integral to all of his economic activities. So that was, that was before the American Revolution. And then in 1775, we know what happens. So there kind of was a buildup and then there was a spark in April, 1775, which um, lit the beginning of the American Revolution. But at the beginning of the American Revolution in 1776, um, we have another account of what was going on here in Saratoga. And this one comes from Charles Carroll. He was a delegate um, to the Continental Congress in 1776. He, he was part of a group um, that was sent up to Canada to try to make Canada the 14th colony. And with him was Benjamin Franklin and Samuel Chase. Um, Samuel Chase, after the American Revolution, is kind of notable because he was a judge on the Supreme Court. And he was the only judge on the Supreme Court who was actually um, impeached. And not just impeached, but found guilty of impeach, so removed from the Supreme Court. Um, but Carroll, um, who was from Maryland, the only Catholic in the um, Continental Congress, describes the land in Saratoga was very good. A stream called Fish Kill was close by, it turned several mills, um, a grist mill, two saw mills. One of them carried 14 saws, and there was also a hemp and flax mill. So you can see that Saratoga was really a bustling place. And then that happened in April. In June and July, we have the, Declar the Declaration of Independence that happens down in Philadelphia involving the same delegates who were not successful in getting Canada to become the 14th colony. Uh, you, you go through the entire campaign of 1776, which was not a good campaign for the Americans. They did declared um, independence and they had a horrible year. And then we get into 1777. And the Northern plan in 1777 was this three pronged attack that Burgoyne came up with, the British General John Burgoyne. It was an attack from Canada, a smaller force coming in through the Mohawk Valley and then forces coming up from New York City. They were taking advantage of the um, waterways of the Hudson, Lake George, um, Lake Champlain and the upper Richelieu. And 
everything ended here with the battles of Saratoga. Um, the turning point of the American Revolution, um, where for the first time in American, well, in world history, a complete British army had to surrender. Um, and um, there's a picture of the surrender. So what happened after the surrender? Uh, after the surrender, there were two different armies. Um, one of the armies was the Convention Army. This was the army of John Burgoyne that surrendered. Um, it started off with about 5,900 officers, soldiers, some of them were British, um, and 600 women and children. And then what happened? They got to march to Cambridge. Um, they weren't great barracks for them in Cambridge. Um, some of them were, was the dorms at Harvard, but most of them weren't. Um, along their way from Saratoga to Cambridge, they lost a number of troops. And this continued on. Um, then they ended up moving to Western Massachusetts. Then um, the isolated Charlottesville, Virginia, and then Fort Frederick, Maryland. And finally, in York, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, near the end of the war um, in 1781. And over those five years, they lost about um, or they, at the end, there were one sixth of their original force. Now, most people just deserted. Um, some people died, um, but they ended up as one sixth. Now, the victorious American army, you would think that, that everything would be coming to them. I mean, they just, um, for the first time in world history, captured a British, a complete British army, but that wasn't the case. Um, they ended up getting the wonderful trip to Valley Forge. Um, and they were part of Washington's army. Uh, they suffered hunger, influenza, typhoid. Um, there was never a battle at Valley Forge, but, this, but disease killed about um, 2,000 of them. And at the end of that, that winter encampment, um, about all that was left was about one sixth of the army that had entered the camp. So it took the Americans a lot less than it took the British to, to whittle down their forces. Um, but one of the things that did happen, and I always like to point this out, is that our first national Thanksgiving was given because of the American success in um, at Saratoga. So people can can say whether or not we were a nation in 1777. I, being a little hometown um, historian, I'd like to say that we were a nation. Um, so Washington set um, aside, or Congress set aside. Um, December 18, 1777, to celebrate the American victory here at Saratoga. So it happened all throughout the colonies, um, including um, in the Continental Army. They, men gathered up, uh, the chaplains performed a divine service, and the men were given special um, food and drink, but one of the American soldiers who um, wrote a lot uh, was Joseph Plum Martin, and he describes how um, this country, ever mindful of the suffering of the army, opened her sympathetic heart so wide that upon, the, upon this occasion gave us something to make the world stare. A half gill of rice and a tablespoon of vinegar. So it really wasn't that great for the Americans. But the um, battles of Saratoga are known as the turning point of the American Revolution. 
in major part because of Benjamin Franklin again, um, being able to uh, talk King Louis into joining the war and then sending fleets and troops to work with the Americans. But one of the things that really did happen um, that I think sometimes gets overshadowed is that after Saratoga, the American Revolution becomes a worldwide battle. Um, there's fighting in India, there's fighting in Africa, there's fighting in the West Indies, along with the 13 colonies. There's fear of invasion of England from France. The largest battle of the war happens in Gibraltar, um, the south of Spain, uh, and the Mediterranean. So once it becomes a worldwide battle uh, or a worldwide war, England starts to look at things a little bit differently. And ultimately, they make an economic decision. Um, they're interested in the sugar trade from the West Indies. And they, they know that financially, they cannot fight a worldwide battle. So they actually end up abandoning on the 13 colonies to keep some of their other worldwide processions. One of the other things I, I mentioned how sometimes I can be a homer. Um, one of the things that I like to do is to point out how important Saratoga is, is by trying to tell history by using the rotunda of the capital. So in the early Federalist period, um, in 1817, Congress commissioned four revolutionary scenes to be painted by John Trumbull um, to hang in the rotunda of the Capitol to basically tell our story. And Saratoga is one of those that um, yeah, gets told. But the other one that I find interesting, of course, is General Washington resigning his commission. And then four more scenes were added um, later on, and that includes the landing of Columbus and um, the baptism of Pocahontas. So after the campaign of 1777, um, our big patron in Saratoga, General Schuyler, um, his military career kind of ends. Uh, he continues to serve, but he doesn't actually resign until April 19th, 1779. April 19th is an important day because that's the day that the American Revolution started in 1775. Um, he also can, um, returned to serve as a continental, um, in the Continental Congress. In 1777, he was a member of the Continental Congress and a general. There was no separation between the two. But he continues to serve, um, or he comes back and serves again. Um, he becomes the first uh, surveyor general for New York. And he's an active military advisor and intelligence advisor to General George Washington. The letters that go back and forth between them are amazing. And he constantly has his finger on what is happening in upstate New York. Um, he has intelligence, people who work for him, who feed him information, and then he shares it with Washington. Washington will also ask him for his advice. Um, so he's a very, very active man. But he also, wants to rebuild his, um, his activities here in Saratoga. He wants to get back up and going. So I mentioned before how important the uh, sawmills are. His house gets totally burnt to the ground here. Most of his barns and all of his mills, other than that upper, upper sawmill, are burnt. Um, so he has to rebuild. And then the upper sawmill suffered heavy vandalism um, from the Continental Army during their stay here in September and October of 1777. So 
he gets his upper mill going very, very quickly. And within a year, he gets the lower mill going, built on the same foundation. Now he builds a house. Um, this is the third Schuyler house that is, is in Saratoga and he builds it in 29 days in November, 1777. He, rebuilds this house using much of the same glass nails locks and hinges from the prior burnt house um, he hires all sorts of masons and blacksmiths and carpenters from albany and schenectady and he pays almost unheard of rates as an incentive for them to leave their home and businesses to rebuild saratoga he also utilizes the foundations from previous buildings who um, were here. Um, the old buildings are cleared away and uh, he rebuilds upon them. Now, this, this house that you can see here um, was only supposed to be temporary. Um, it was described as a neat box. It was constructed um, very simply and temporarily um, to provide cover as he um, oversaw the rebuilding of other um, buildings and foundations and barns. But the house ends up staying. Um, there are some additions that are made to it, but Saratoga never really got to the grandeur that was there 10 years before. Um, the spirit and the liveliness is still lacking. Um, but the area is still part of this continuing war. Um, so it's not necessarily the safest place to be. Now, a Frenchman visits the area in 1780 and he notes that he saw two or three sawmills in operation. Um, there's the upper mill complex, um, which was quite complex. It had 15 saws simultaneously cutting a cutting a log into 16 boards and this is when the Italian um, men Count de Verdi, um, de Vermi was here along with George Washington and Alexander Hamilton all in July of 1783 um, and I believe that this account also describes that it, the sawmill was being operated by a slave so that gets us to um, Schuyler and slavery. Now, here are a listing of the slaves that lived in the Schuyler house in 1776. We don't have any names for a later period, but Peter, Prince, Cato, Lively, Adams, Tom, Jenny, Dinah, Molly, and Mary. And they performed a variety of, of jobs, including escorting freight and livestock, harvesting crops, lots of mill working, garden, gardeners, lumberjacks, road builders, builders, family escorts, um, and domestics. There's no question that um, General Schuyler had slaves. The historical records show that. Um, Slavery was part of Saratoga's early development. The slaves that worked for Philip Schuyler were never referred to as slaves by the general. Instead, they were commonly referred to as family servants or workers. Um, so it's important to understand that slavery is just not a Southern profit, a problem, that it's integral and inseparable part of the Dutch colonial early American um, economic development throughout the new world. And through census records, receipts, and Schuyler's letters, we can piece together that there were about 30 people enslaved under Philip Schuyler. And this is how he could manage a large farming operation. I mentioned before that um, many of his outputs, grist, flax, lumber mills, um, fish were sold as, at a profit in New York City and also in sugar producing islands of Jamaica and Antigua. Slavery was integral to 
all of his economic activities. And Schuyler was, was definitely a great many things. He was a great military leader. He was unbelievable at logistics. He was a statesman. He was a community and state developer. He was a businessman. He was the richest man in Albany at his time. He was also very involved in slavery. And like many of our founding fathers, he walked a crooked line between owning slaves and supporting freedom for all. Schuyler also had a number of visitors. And one of my favorite is this Francois Chastelitz. Now my, my French is not very good, so I'm sure I mispronounced this. But Chastelitz was um, a logistics officer who landed in Newport in 1780, um, the early winter of 1780 with Rochambeau's army. And one of the first things that he wanted to see was where Burgoyne surrendered. So he left Rochambeau's army, he went up to Albany, he met Philip Schuyler. Philip Schuyler started them off and arranged for guides to take him through the battle fields um, in December 1780. Uh, it had snowed, it was cold, it was ice across the Hudson River. And he describes his night in Saratoga with the general that he got there at seven in the evening after um, a 30 mile journey, they found good room, um, an excellent supper, and they had a gay and agreeable conversation. Um, he describes General Schuyler like many European husbands is still more admirable when he's absent from his wife. And he gave us instructions for the next day's expedition, which took him up to, and many people visited what they called the Great Cataract, which were the falls in Glens Falls. And on his way up, he went up through Fort Edward and he saw the site where Jane McCrae was supposedly, um, no, where Jane McCrae was killed by the Indians. And they saw the old fort at Fort Edward. Um, it's a great account. So as the war goes on, things aren't safe here. Um, so there's a series of raids and counter raids. Um, there's raids by royalists. And I like using the word royalist rather than loyalist. They kind of mean the same thing. Um, in British allied American Indians in 1778, they destroyed American settlements in Pennsylvania and in New York. In 1779, Washington ordered General Sullivan and Clinton to retaliate and destroy the Six Nation, the Iroquois towns, homes, and foods. And these raids and counter raids happened in 1783. Um, the History Center has a great video that was recently done on the Balltown raid and in 1780. That was one of those raids and that involves a different part of this area. One of the interesting people that I like to focus in on um, is General Stark. Now, General Stark, who was from New Hampshire, has a long history in the Saratoga border land. Um, he originally served here as a lieutenant in Rogers Rangers during the French and Indian War. And then, of course, he commanded the militia troops um, in the victory at Bennington in 1777, and he was very involved in the battles at Saratoga um, after the Battle of Bennington, where he kind of really stopped Burgoyne from retreating further north. Stark was made a major general and he commanded the Northern Department in Saratoga in 1781. So the, the whole continental the, the whole American army was broken into departments. The Northern Department covered Saratoga and in, in upstate New York into Canada. And um, we had a couple of different people who were in charge, but for the most part, um, in 1781 through 1782, it was John Stark. And when it wasn't John Stark, it was William Alexander. Now, William Alexander also has a tie here 
William Alexander's wife was William Jewell, who I mentioned early on, who had the land up in Fort Miller. Now, many times the Northern Department was commanded out of Albany, but Stark actually commanded it here out of Saratoga. And here's an account of a um, actual raid that happened. Um, it was a royalist raid in 1781, where there were a number of, of individuals who came down south of um, St. John um, with the goal of uh, um, trying to capture people and bring them further north, whether it be General Schuyler or some of the militia colonels. And one of the most famous ones was this um, local man by the name of Thomas Lovelace. So he came down, he was somewhat set up by his neighbors, uh, a Colonel Van, Van Eck, who lived um, at Dovegate, um, which is our Colville area of the town of Saratoga. Uh, he got captured. He was brought in. There was a military trial for him um, because he was a spy and he was found guilty and he was hung. And what you see in front of you is the actual um, correspondence or the order from Stark ordering his hanging. Um, so that happened uh, in 1781. Um, another, there were major concerns in 1781 and they ended up having the um, two regiments at the same time that most of the army is down um, capturing Cornwallis at Yorktown, two regiments, the 10th Massachusetts and 1st New Hampshire, were sent up to Saratoga because there was a fear that the British were invading from Canada and serious concerns about holding Albany and that Albany was going to be attacked. So Stark was here with these two regiments. Ultimately, the 10th Mass ends up going out to the Mohawk Valley at that time. And then we get to the last regiment that was here was the Rhode Island Regiment. Now, the Rhode Island Regiment was sent here in 1782, the fall of 1782. Um, it was known as the Black Regiment. Um, there were a number of Black soldiers that served in it, and they spent um, little over a year, 13 months, um, here in Saratoga. And their, um, their adjutant who kept this journal really didn't like um, his time here. Um, he keeps on describing how um, in the month of November, they remained here. Nothing happened worthy of remark. Um, they continued time fixing the barracks and nothing happened worthy of remarks. Um, they went on furlough back to um, Rhode Island and then they came back here in April, or at least he did. Some of the troops stayed here. Um, and they described that they continued in garrison very sedentary. Nothing happened worthy of remarks, except for they kept themselves busy in a skittle and ball alley. Well, that's basically baseball. That's the 18th century description of baseball. And although Balsam Spa is very, very proud of their baseball history, uh, I'd like to find another community in Saratoga County that can document baseball before 1783. I think Saratoga might have it. Um, in June 1783, he spends an awful lot of detail describing going to the Salt Springs, Saratoga Springs. Um, and they describe, again, nothing material happens. Now, one of the best things that they have here is they have the 13 toast that he drank on July 4th. Now, it's very, very common to drink 13 toasts as a celebration. 
Um, they drank the 13 toast and they had a discharge of volleys and muskets. You can read exactly what the toasts were there. But one of the things that I really enjoyed was this toast here. Uh, may the purity of morals and dignity of deport, deportment of every character of the citizens of the United States. I think that's probably a good one for these days. Um, and then we continue on, nothing transpired worthy of remarks. He also says that His Excellency George Washington passes through this place on his way to Crown Point to review those Northern works. He passes through here with Alexander Hamilton. You notice he doesn't mention Alexander Hamilton um, in this account, although I think today we would always mention Alexander Hamilton. The day after Baron von Steuben, the Inspector General, passes through here. Again, nothing worthy of remarks. Um, in September and October, there's a great description of a long trip up Lake George and Lake Champlain. Um, they continue to describe a very sedentary life. Um, on October 19th in 1783, they have a very severe storm. And I should say, most of the army has left their post back in April. So for these folks to still be of service, these are some of the longest serving troops in the American Revolution. And finally, on December 5th, they receive their orders for discharge. And they find out that the reason it took so long is that the post had been laid in in Albany since the 18th of November. Now, in the following two weeks, they're all ready to go, except for they don't have any clothes. They describe their, naked, their men as naked. So they send this Lieutenant Wheaton down to Albany to try to get some shoes and clothing. And all he can come back with is one pair of shoes for each man. And then they finally leave on December 25th. Um, all their men leave. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the story of the town of Saratoga, I encourage you to go to the town's website and click on history. You can come to our history blog. We also have a Facebook page and Twitter accounts and all sorts of other social media. So oh, I am gonna go back here, jump in here and take any questions you might have. And good, I'm glad to see that there's still an audience here. So if anybody has any questions, you can just put it right in the chat. Um, of the Brits that deserted, did they head home or did they settle locally and how were they treated? The Brits um, and the Germans, for the most part, um, were treated fairly well. Um, there's a whole variety of things that happened with that convention army. Many of the soldiers just kind of dropped off and became part of the United States. Um, sometimes they were traveling through and they, um, would just start to harvest um, or help people with the harvest. And then they just kind of stuck on. Uh, if they had skills, those skills were needed in America. So they helped out. Some of them ended up joining the American forces. Some of them ended up um, getting back into the British lines and joining loyalist troops or joining the British. There's a whole variety of things for both the British and the German. There's some really well done work um, that was translated by Helga um, Dog. Oh, somebody's going to have to help me with Hel Helga's last name, um, Doglin, um, who lived here in the town of Saratoga. Um, she translated some German diaries. 
and there's some great descriptions of um, bundling practices um, on their trip over into Cambridge. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, all right, as I look here, um, Americans have been educated that, uh, and I missed that one. Um, so Jim asked me about uh, loyalists living in the area during the early stages of the war. There were a number of loyalists that were living in the area. Um, most of them, we had a very active committee of safety in the area. So the committee of safety, um, they were tough. Um, they were a bit of a kangaroo court. Um, it wasn't safe for loyalists to be here. So some of the loyalists went up to Canada. Some of the loyalists went down to New York City. Some of them came back as the Lovelace person did um, to get um, revenge um, and to capture some of their neighbors. Um, Jim, I think your video um, on the war on middle line also goes into that. Um, so. Didn't you have, um, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, Go okay. Jim. Now, I'm trying to think of the, the person that was the loyalist. I thought that was uh, hung or something over there. Lovejoy. Was it Lovejoy? No, it's the Lovelace guy that I was. Lo oh, Lovelace. About. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that. No, he that, was hung. Yep. Yeah. And then I just recently wrote an article for um, about another loyalist um, at a mill um, in Grangerville. Um, whose mill was burned during the, um, during the battles of Saratoga. Um, oh yeah, Jones, right? Jones, yep, yeah, thank you, um, Jones. Um, and there were some people who were accused of being loyalists and we weren't really sure if they were loyalists. Um, sometimes it's really difficult because people wouldn't sign. So if you were an American, you were expected to sign a loyalty oath and not everybody was willing to sign the loyalty oath. So you had some people who served in the French and Indian War, took an oath to the king and didn't want to sign a loyalty oath to America. So, and I'm thinking of the Sword family in particular. Um, so they were deemed loyalists and they were put into prison as loyalists. Um, the Bemis family um, had a tavern um, and that's where the Bemis Heights comes from. Um, they went back and forth on ownership and who was a loyalist and who wasn't a loyalist. So not all of the activities or people who were who were clean to be loyalists may have been actually loyalists. Some of it may have been um, economic de um, desires of their neighbors um, to maybe own a tavern or something. Um, so there's still an awful lot of questions and that's an area that really hasn't been researched um, very well. Um, what are the accounts about how Schuyler treated his slaves? Um, they seem to be very professional. Um, that seems to be most of the accounts, but there's an awful lot of research that's currently being done on the issue of slavery and Schuyler's slaves. So you know, let's give it a little bit of time and see what comes out of that research. Um, that's one of the great things about, again, being a historian in this community is that the research never ends. Um, and, I, and I am aware that the Park Service has hired a researcher to look into just that question of who were the slaves, what can we find out about them? Um, also, the staff at the Schuyler Mansion, the state staff, I have done an awful lot of work on slavery. So it's an exciting time as far as a historian to find out more of what was going on. Um, I will say that Schuyler's slave, there's at least one account of, of a Schuyler slave uh, running away and Schuyler taking out ads to get that slave returned. Um, and there's a lot more to that. Uh, but you know, more to come. Um, the Americans have been, okay. Um, the War of Independence was defined as the um, USA. 
weren't the French Indian Wars much more defining. Otherwise, we'd be speaking French. Um, I don't know about that. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, Canada or Quebec, um, when you look at Quebec history, um, they describe the French and Indian period as, as the conquest. And they're still speaking French out there. Uh, they're not speaking English. Um, so I, I think um, I, I think in general, one of the disservices that happens to us as Americans um, in some of our some of our history lessons is that we don't see the the worldwide impact of the American Revolution. And, and it really is, it becomes a worldwide war. Um, and when it does, England makes an economic choice. So it's a little less of the freedoms and the, um, the ideals that are written in the American Revolution, and it becomes more of a decision made on um, what, what covers the bottom line and how much work can we afford. Um, as, as many wars do. Um, did local residents participate in provisioning the troops? Um, they did, um, sometimes not as um, the way that people describe. Um, so I'm gonna first of all deal with the later period. Um, the Schuyler, so when the troops, there were five, there were at least five barracks in Saratoga itself, and there was a blockhouse. Um, we think the barracks were where the where the current town hall is, where the former school is, at the corner of Spring and um, Broad Street, Broadway. There, um, Broad Street is is what most people call it today. Um, at the intersection of Twenty Nine and Four and Thirty Two. Um, Although there, there's at least one account that they may have been a, at a different location, but for the most part, things line up there. Um, the soldiers were, uh, they were hurting for food and there's descriptions of them basically pilfering the food um, in the gardens of the Skylars, um, taking carrots. Um, during the battles of Saratoga, in the Skylaville area, the Saratoga area during the seven day siege period, there's a great account of the German troops um, going into a um, plot that had turnips in it. And they were harvesting the turnips and they got captured by the light infantry and the riflemen. And part of when they got captured, um, they lost their packs, which had, had the turnips in it. Um, and there's just such energy. In fact, um, that account also has a Connecticut militiaman um, involved in it. And he is so positive in his energy of, you know, we know we're about to win and we're going to capture a uh, complete British army. So that's kind of pretty exciting. Um, okay. Any other questions? Do we have any more questions? Feel free to put them down if you do. No? Well, I want to thank Sean very much indeed for, for his talk. And I want to thank everybody for being part of it as well. Um, now some um, obligatory advertisements, you don't get away with, with nothing. Um, I want to remind everybody our artisan market is open again tomorrow. I think it opens at noon. Uh, so it's open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and uh, there's some good stuff there. I shall be there on Saturday. Uh, and and I'm going to be there on Sunday. Sunday. Oh, there you go. Um, Mark, your, we'll see who gets more people. Um, mark your calendars for our next experts next door, which will be uh, Thursday, January 14th. Um, keep your eyes open for it. Our presenter then will be. Dr. James Brewer-Stewart, who is the James Wallace Professor of History Emeritus. 
um, at McAllister College, and we'll be discussing connecting the classroom to the community. Um, and so I hope you all have a wonderful holiday. Um, keep safe and look forward to seeing you at another presentation or some event at the Saratoga History Center, Saratoga County History Center. Thank you so much. Good night. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sean. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. You're welcome. Good job, Sean. Hey, Peggy. <laughs> Thank you. Like the tie, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I said he looked very spiffy. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you.